Our next speaker is uh, Christine Schlesinger, and I always slaughter her last name because I always just call her Christine. <laughs> and she is an SEO expert. I mean, Christine eats, breathes, sleeps, lives SEO every day. She's written on some of the most influential SEO blogs out there. Uh, she doesn't do much work in healthcare IT, maybe nothing. I think she's done a chiropractor office, which is the closest she come. But that's good because she knows the ins and outs of SEO. Uh, you know, I, I'm pretty sure she has a secret camera in Matt Cuts, which probably many of you SEO experts understand that, but at least she'll smile. He's the Google SEO expert. <laughs> and so she knows the ins and outs, so I think she'll give us a real good understanding of how to do SEO. Uh, I told her not to dive too deep because I don't think any of us in here are planning to program, right? Are you going to program your site for us yet? I didn't. Maybe one. All right, well, you should hang out with her after and dig into some more of the details. But for the rest of us, uh, we want to know more of the, you know, how do we find it and, and all those things and how do we do it the right way. So uh, welcome, Christine, to the stage. First, everybody in the back, you should not make fun of you if you stay back there and don't move up front. Just let you know. Actually, I don't. It's just check. So, okay. So, SEO, just kind of show of hands, like, basic to, like, average knowledge. Okay? Like, pretty good knowledge. And, like, I'm going to be really bored because I know so much. No? Okay. That's good. There's the other room. <laughs> so I tried to throw in, it's basically going to do an overview of some things. I also threw in some high, uh, some more advanced tips as well. As uh, John said, we're not getting down deep and dirty into uh, like here's how you do a title tag. Um, you can find a lot of that information online. You can always ask me a question or send me an email if you want. Um, these are more kind of the things that are just general if you're talking about a site. Um, the kind of current myths that are going around right now, uh, kind of some of the things you need to know, some of the very basics, and then some things you're never going to hear anywhere or see anywhere. So like, did you know that when you put a site on your DNS, on your hosting, that Google already knows you're there? How many people knew that? And that Google already finds you? So what's the only way to like hide your site from Google? No, uh, but good, good guess, uh, a, a login. Since Google actually is a domainer and Google actually registers sites, the minute you put your site on a server somewhere, Google is already calling you. So the only way you can hide your site from Google is to put it behind a login. If anyone tells you any different, they don't know. Okay, so we'll cover a little of those kind of things and then we're just gonna cover kind of the general hierarchy of things. Okay. Um, if you're an SEO, this just makes you laugh. I don't know why, it just does. If you do web or internet, it's only about cats and unicorns. And, uh, let's see, is this work? Okay, so what is SEO? It started out as search engine optimization, which just meant we optimize things for the search engines. We kind of put them in the top position. So people will click on them and you get users to your site and you get traffic and you make money. And, or if you're providing information, people come to your site as a resource. And that's awesome. By the way, um, my German friend tells me I speak fast, so if I'm speaking too fast, just say nicht muss so schnell. It's German, or just slow down, okay? So um, anyway, so if uh, with search engine optimization back in the day, that's how it first started. It would, and it first started really with people who were just trying to make money online. Google came out, Yahoo was there, and people were like, hey, I'm gonna make a lot of money, I'm gonna optimize these things for number one, and you're gonna buy like, you know, nowadays it'd be Viagra. Okay, so we rank stuff. Well, yeah, sort of. And then there's a lot more that goes into it. So just so you know, the very basics, if someone says your site is ranking or it's indexed, you kind of need to know the difference. I know this seems really, really simple. But if your site, someone says your site's out of the index, do people know what that means? How many? Right, so if someone says to you right now, your site's out of the index, that should like drop, put in your stomach, and you should be calling your IT guy right now. Because that means Google is taking you out, or Bing is taking you out completely out of the searchability of their index. You are no longer find, findable. They will not find your website. Okay, so that's what indexing is. That means they come out, they find your website, they scoop up all the pages, or as many pages as they care to, and they show them to other people when they search for you. Okay, or when they search for terms related to you. 
When it comes to ranking, and we actually are now calling it positioning, and I'll explain why in a minute. Ranking is about where you position in those results. So what's a common word that you guys would like to position for? Just generally in your industry. Healthcare, Healthcare right? Okay, that'd be a big, you know, go daddy, or big, not go daddy, big daddy word. So let's say healthcare. So healthcare, if you're positioned on page one for healthcare, then you've got the world looking at that page for healthcare, and that's your positioning or your ranking. So this basically, by the way, I put more on my slides, and I'm going to read through this, is so when you look at them later, you know what I was talking about. I hate those slides where you get like one word, and later you go back to them, and you're like, uh, I don't know what that meant. Okay, so this is just a definition of indexing and ranking, which we just talked about, okay? So where do we do this? Back in the day, these were a bunch of the search engines that existed. And we're not talking that long ago. I used to go to a conference where they had meet the search engines, and there were like all these guys on stage, and they talked. It was really fun and exciting. And then about five years ago, it became these three, and then it became this one, okay? Now, Bing has made a strong comeback. It was only 7% about three years ago. It's now up to about 27%. But the problem is, if you optimize for Bing, you lose Google. If you optimize for Google, you're still going to get Bing, and you might tweak a little bit. I mean, yeah, and you might tweak a little bit for Bing. Okay, so Google's algorithm is dominant, and that's the one that you have to rank for, or position for. <coughs> when you go back, you can tweak for certain terms in Bing if you want to. So in February, these are the most recent statistics. Google has 69% of the searches, and this is in the United States, organically, and 27% of the searches were powered by Bing. If you go overseas, Google, Google could be as high as 99%. Sorry, I'm having trouble speaking, it seems. <laughs> okay, so 99% in some countries. So if, you have, if you're working in foreign international SEO, and you're missing the Google algorithm, you're missing a lot of visitors and you traffic to your site. Now, this means, though, that you do have to start paying attention to Bing again. Two years ago, no one paid attention to Bing. Like, no one cared. It's like, eh, Microsoft, <laughs> whatever. They do tend to convert higher than Google does. And Google made some changes last year. We'll go over it quickly. Called Hummingbird, which is actually supposedly a better search component, but it's actually a worse one. So they're finding that people are kind of migrating. Now, they're not migrating the way necessary from Google, but they're not finding what they say they want in Google. And that might spell more of a shift, so keep your eye on Bing and these statistics. You can find them at a site called Comscore. They report on them every month. So again, let's back to what is search engine optimization. So a name, right, it smells of sweet, rose, that kind of thing. So you might hear it called SEO or SEM, search engine marketing. Also inbound marketing, online marketing, digital marketing, website marketing, marketing. There's like 5,000 terms you'll hear us call ourselves. That's because we don't actually have a name right now. Basically, whatever the agency decides to call itself is what it calls itself. Whatever it feels it best represents what it does because there isn't a real way to represent it because we don't just position things anymore in Google and Bing and the search engines. Now there's a whole host of other things we do. So sometimes you'll see here people say marketing, multi multimedia marketing, web marketing. People outside our industry will say it's voodoo or magic or bovine feces. Okay? Um, it's none of these. Okay, I can assure you. There, it's an algorithm. It's mathematical. There are things we know. Google will not tell us exactly how they do things, but because it is a mathematical algorithm, there are things we do know about it. There are things that we can test scientifically. There are things we can check. Things that always happen. Things that are core components. No matter what they change, they don't change those core systems because it is an algorithm. So it's not voodoo and it's not bovine feces. The reason that happens though is there's a lot of bad SEOs, who make a lot of, they're not really SEOs, they just call themselves FCOs, who make quick money because people look for cheap services and they get taken and then they say, oh, that was a bunch of BS, right? And check back next week because we'll probably have another name. So is this because we're crazy and SEOs just don't know what to call themselves, they have like multiple personality disorder or something? No, because this is the standard chart that put out by uh, an e-sign called Search Engine Land um, every year. It's the ranking chart, ranking factors chart. This is really good for you to know and look at. I put the link at the bottom, but it's out every year. Everyone looks at it. Everyone in SEO and the industry looks at it. These are all the factors that go into, by category, ranking a web page or a website. I'm not going to go over all these. This is something you can look up yourself. But this gives you an idea of what we're looking at. So. 
There's on page to the left factors and off page to the right. And you can see what those are. So we have content, we have HTML code, we have site architecture, we have off-page factors like leak, trust, social, and personal. So it's not just these factors, there's also additional factors. If two people from the same city but different IP addresses, right, look at the same thing, the same keywords, you usually don't get the same results anymore, do you? Right? Do people know why that is? Okay, it's called geolocation geolo yeah. and geolocalization and personalization. So when you look at something all the time and you click, 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 right, you get that same result and it comes to number one. So sometimes we'll get a client saying, I'm number one, and you're like, well, no, you're not. You just click on yourself a lot and Google puts you number one for you. Okay, so also device type makes a difference. Are you on a tablet? Are you on a Mac? Are you on a PC? That makes a difference. So. That's why we say positioning. You don't have a rank. If someone comes to you and goes, as, a, as one of what we do, and says, I want to rank number one, and you're like, okay, where? Would you like to rank number one in your city, in your country, in your town, on your IP address, on somebody else's? How would you like that to appear? Because uh, would that be on a mobile phone? Would that be on a tablet? Which type of phone? A Mac? Would you like to be a PC? And what else would you like them to have looked at that's similar to you to be number one? There is no such thing as can absolutely, unconditionally number one result. There is a page of 10 results that mostly will be the same. Three or four results will be different based on these things. Geolocation, personalization, device type, these other factors. Okay, so what we basically do is bring you traffic, which equals money, or at least the right traffic. So a lot of ways people get taken when it comes to SEO services is they get lots of traffic, but it's the wrong traffic. So it's like we've had clients come in when we do a site audit and they're like, but I've got like 10 million visitors a month. It really was a big company who did that. We're like, but how many clicks are you getting off that? And they're like, oh, 0.5%. Like, well, great. So you've got really bad traffic coming to your site and that can actually hurt you in Google because Google has a thing about relevancy. And if you're getting a lot of traffic, but you're getting no click-throughs, you're not relevant for that traffic, which can actually damage your site and lower your other positions. So SEO, how do we define it? Uh, Matt Cuts. It actually looks better than that. This is a really bad page, brother. How many people know who Matt Cuts is? Hey, it's in the back. You should know this name. Even if you're the only the person who hires SEOs, you should know this name. If you're only the person who's going to look at service issues, you should know this name. Matt Cuts defines what happens with the algorithm. He defines what happens to your website. If your website gets a penalty, this is the man who defined it. This is the man you have to go and beg to sometimes. Put your website back in the rankings. He's the one who's the public face of Google's web spam team. His whole job is to fight spam at Google. Now people forget that Google has a product and their product is to make sure that they deliver relevant content to you, the user. So if it's filled with spam results, then that's not a good product, right? So his whole job is to make sure that the site, the rele there's relevancy there and to get rid of the spam results. So you don't wind up with like porn and Viagra. He actually wrote the algorithm that got rid of porn at Google. No joke. He's also worth a lot of money because he did that. It's like employee number 63. Super nice guy though. Like he'll come to PubCon Vegas here, walk around, give you a hug. He's like, good guy. Um, so anyways, he calls it search experience uh, optimization and I think that's probably the better term right now and that's just what are users experiencing when they're coming to your website? If it's good for users, Google usually thinks it's good for you. And you'll hear him say that over and over again. He also has a webmaster channel where you can ask him, where people ask him questions on YouTube and you can look them up and he shows videos and he answers questions. So it's a really good resource, Matt Cutt's uh, video channel for webmasters, to like go and look up things. Do you, have, do you have a question, something happened to your website, somebody's telling you something, you're hiring somebody, you're not sure, go see, did he answer that question? Because if he answered that question, then that's the answer. Now, he also says things like, don't use links, right? Don't, don't build links. Well, eh, you know, he doesn't want people to build links, we build links. There's reasons for that. So you can't take everything he says as 100% you can't do. You have to know how to read what he says, but he is the one who makes the rules. So SEO is which part of these things? Anybody want to guess? What's that? Yay! Right. It's all of it. So it's part of your 
hosting, your site setup, your platform choice, your content management system, how you design your site, your site code, everything that's on here, your content choices, your authorship, and more, of course. But everything that's on here is part of your SEO value of your site. Also, these fall into play as well. Your press releases, white papers, newspaper mentions, articles, interviews, industry publications, citations, where you're located on the web. By the way, a little tip, make sure that anywhere your name, reference, address, phone number shows up, all these are exactly the same. You will rank differently on local results or you rank differently based on those things. If those are not exactly the same, your phone number is different, your address is different, then you will have a different ranking result in local or, or in the universal search for local geo. Meaning that if I'm in Vegas and you're in Vegas, even if it's not a local result, like a Google Places result, but you want people to find you in Vegas, those things don't match up, you'll have a lower level um, score in the algorithm if those don't match. These are also all link building opportunities and that's why they fall under SEO. Okay, you can't go out and buy links. Right now they're home only sites. We never bought links, that's not what we do. We always build them naturally, but people do. You can't get away with them anymore. So these are all link building opportunities. You should have an SEO that helps drive you and make sure that these are matching up with your website goals. So while your website is still a thought or any new part of your website's a thought or anything you're doing on your website's a thought, your SEO plan should not be. So your SEO person or company or agency, whoever you're working with, should be there from day one. You shouldn't have hired anybody else, not a web developer, not a designer, not a site architect, nothing until you got the SEO in place. Because that person has driven everything that you do. The way you place your address on your site makes a difference. How many graphics you have above the fold, quote unquote above the fold, Google has an above the fold definition on your website, that makes a difference. How many ads you use is actually a penalty if you use too many. Use too many graphics above the fold, it's a penalty in Google. Right? So you have to make sure that you have all these things in place. You want good links back to your site. You want that SEO orchestrating this plan for you. Right? To make sure that when that press release goes out, it matches that social media, it matches a page on your site, and that those things all come back to you. But that they don't use too much anchor text because if you do that wrong now, it's a penalty. And why is this so important now? Because about 18 months ago, Google started hammer, bringing the hammer down on websites for penalties and they created new ones. And now it wasn't just about who's scamming Google, it's about making sure everything's quality and Google's quality. And Google are the police and we have to play their game. By the way, you have plenty of time for questions, but if you have any in the meantime, feel free to raise your hand. So how many of you heard links are dead? I had someone call me and say, I'm ranking number one for everything, this is just like two weeks ago, and I, but I, I fired my link builder. Because I heard links are dead and I shouldn't make them anymore. And I'm like, are you kidding me? Really? You got rid of your link builder who's got you ranking number one for everything that you need to rank for and because you heard links are dead? He's like, yes. I'm like, okay, that's really bad. You don't do that. Links are not dead. Links are not come out of the Google algorithm, okay? Bad links will get your site in trouble. How many of anybody admit to a penalty here on a website that they run, own, or know? Of course, it wouldn't be yours, it would be someone else's, but... Yeah, anybody have a link penalty? Maybe, yeah. So, links are what they're really coming down on right now. Uh, my blog, uh, my guest blog network, my podcast, the person who runs that was on a panel with me as her network was taken down, like, that day. She woke up, Matt Cutts wrote a tweet, taking down my blog guest network today. She's on the panel next to me, I'm like, yay. <laughs> awesome, this isn't awkward at all. <laughs> That's her entire life, right? Her living right there, <laughs> right? Matt Cuts, head of Google, just took out her whole network because he doesn't like the links that come from it. So they're really coming out. By the way, she took it and handled it very, very well. But the thing is, they're very, very much coming out on links right now. So you have to be very careful. But links are not dead in any way, and the algorithm in Google has not said that, and Matt Cuts has reiterated they're not. So you can't link buy, you have to link build. Yeah, yeah, we're talking about it right here. So good links according to Google are natural links that you receive because someone said, hey, I really like your content and I'm gonna build a link to your site. So anyone have a favorite site? Like just a regular site, it doesn't have to be a healthcare site. Just a hobby site? No, nobody has a favorite site? Nobody here was on the internet? Like everybody's like, like hand in hand? I like Goodreads. 
Okay, good reads. So you like good reads and you share that link with friends, right? And you might put it on your own, let's say, blog or website. And that's a link and that's a vote. And Google says that's good. And a lot of people share that same link or a lot of things to Goodreads. Google says that's a good site. Lots of people like it. Lots of different people like it. That's a natural link. Bad links to Google is anything not natural. Anything you didn't find on your you know, daily crawl on the web and share and put on your blog and whatever. Now, if that was how you did your website, your website would never do anything because how long would it take you to get any links to your site? No one's seen your site before. Your site's just sitting on the internet somewhere. It's like ranking position 5,020 for a keyword, right? So people build links. So bad links are like link buying. Guest blogs on irrelevant sites where like the, the blog has like, it's talking about like, you know, how to make bacon and then like how to, you know, do surgery and, you know, remember eHow? Come pops up again and goes away. It's like how to do brain surgery, you know, open head, take out brain, put brain back in, like that. Those are considered like bad, like networks, bad content networks, bad blog networks. Um, article directories, unmoderated directories, forms, especially for putting links on. If someone tells you they're going to do these things to build links to your site, run away really fast. Um, good links are like moderated directories, like where someone's moderating what goes on them. Um, journal publications, articles, like if you get an article on Huffington Post, awesome. Get an article on a journal, eZine, that's awesome. If you're writing for somebody, that's great. These are kind of good links. So what goes into making a link profile good are things they look at. Are link types, how strong the link is, like is the site a really strong site or a weak site? There's ways that they measure this. Um, link acquisition rate. Did you just acquire like a thousand links over a week and you had none? Well, Google's going to look into that. Is there a reason? Well, sure, if you just went public, like Facebook went public one day, we're not, let's pretend Facebook was a different kind of company, but they went public IPO, there's going to be 10,000 links, right? Of course, because people are talking about it. But if you suddenly acquire like a thousand links to your site and there's no reason for it that Google can surmise, then that looks suspicious, right? So how you acquire links and how fast you acquire links is very important as well. Um, anchor link, text link, anchor text of the link um, means like it used to be you could be like, I sell blue widgets, so every link should say blue widgets in it that comes to my site. If you do that now and it's over, it was 60% now, I think it's as low as 30%. If more than 30% of your links have that anchor text in it to your site, you can get a penalty. Now the penalty can be small, it can just be the pages that it links to. It can be big, it can mean you can lose your homepage in the index. You type in your name or your company and it no longer comes up. So anchor text is a big one. Um, IP diversity and class diversity. This means that when you buy links, a lot of times they're all sitting on the same IP addresses, the IP block or the class block, and this is just where the links come from. And so Google looks to see, are the IPs from all different places? IP address meaning the home address of the server they're coming from. And um, if they're not, then that can be a penalty for you. So if you see something like this, it's really bad, okay? Link building is one of the most expensive things you can do for your website because it takes a lot of time, effort, and relationships. My partner who does our link building, he can get you an article on Huffington Post, right? That's a really good link, right? That's going to give you a lot of value with Google. But it's not cheap, and the relationship he built to get you, be able to get you that link on Huffington Post, you know, means that it, it took him a lot of time to do that. It isn't going to cost you $9.99. So what happens to sites that use bad links or have bad link profiles? So penalties, what they typically look like is this in your analytics. How many people have their Google Analytics or look at them on any regular basis? Okay. So this is what typically a link penalty looks like. You wake up one day and you're like, ah, I have no traffic. It all went away overnight. Now, it's not always the case, though, so don't assume you have a penalty. You have to look for a penalty update. It will be announced. Google will say, we updated last night, yada, yada, for this problem, right? For links, for content, for ad display, for whatever. If your site doesn't have that issue, you probably don't have that penalty. But if you have that issue and you don't have that penalty at the same day, or over the same two-day period, three-day period, then that's probably the penalty that you have. This is a slope reaction. It can be like this or just a very long, slow degradation. There are penalties that look more like that. They're much harder to detect. So don't assume that when you're starting to lose traffic that there may not be a penalty in there. They don't always look like cliffs. Cliffs are just easy ones to detect. 
Best thing to do when you have a penalty is get a professional to check out your site, do a site audit, because you may not know what you're looking at. There's a lot of reasons things can happen that way. Could just be you have more competitors in your area. And you know, suddenly you went from one to page two, right? And because you 10 more people entered page one. So you really want to make sure that you've lost it because of penalty. Because if you start doing penalty recovery and you don't have a penalty, you can actually hurt your site. So Google has two types of penalties, manual and algorithmic. The reason we're going over this is kind of like, kind of like the most major thing that you could know about your site, right? Because if you have a penalty, you need to know what to do. So manual is when Google looks at your site and goes, I don't like what I'm looking at and I'm devaluing your site. Now I may just devalue the links or I'm going to devalue the keyword like to your site. So those pages related to that keyword or the page itself or the URLs or the URL in your site or the domain itself. I, there was a site we worked on that got their home page and 75% of their pages kicked. They did one thing wrong. They did a really bad link buy. Google said we don't like it and they were out of the index for 16 months until we got them back. They were paying $100,000 a month on Google Clicks. Okay, so that can happen. So you have to be really, really careful. Manual penalties can be site-wide or partial. Um, this one just shows the partial one where it's user generated spam. How many people have blogs? How many people know you can get a, get a penalty just for the comments people leave on your blog? Forum. You can. It's called user generated spam. So be very careful to lock those down and make sure that people aren't leaving links and comment spam on your blogs and forums. Those are really important. If you get that, the good thing is it's pretty easy to clean up with Google. Show that you cleaned it up and they'll reinstate your site. Um, I call that a user not at home penalty. Google's just looking, going, hey, no one's watching the site, clean this up. Um, these are basically, you look this up at Google, I left the link down below. These are all the manual penalties that you can get on your site. I'm not gonna go over every single one. Manual penalties recovery is a little bit harder because when you have to recover from a manual penalty, the good part about it is you know pretty much what's wrong and what to do to fix it. The hard part is you have to submit to Google and it's under Google's good graces that they decide to return your site or they decide not to. This is also where it helps to get an expert involved because we do this all the time. We have a pretty good idea on how to get you back in. We got the person that was kicked for 16 months back in in three. Google didn't return their homepage, so it took us another three months to get their homepage back. Right? So these are things we know how to do that maybe a regular person will not know how to do and a regular, you know, just doesn't experience this every day. Algorithmic penalties are when Google algorithmically devalues your site. Now Google likes to do the algorithm more than it likes to like go and shh. Like people think Google likes to slam people like, oh yeah, I feel good, but they really don't. So the algorithm is a way for them to be neutral. They send out the mathematical thing and it goes to your site and you did something wrong and the algorithm slaps you. Well, it doesn't matter who you are, right? Because you can't come back to them and go, Google doesn't like my site because I sell cookies. Right? Obviously, there's more political reasons that you could say. But Google, you can't come back to Google and say that. It's an algorithmic penalty. You did something against the algorithm. You can't come back to them and say they, you don't, Google doesn't like you. So they like the algorithm. So the algorithm comes out and it makes what we call devaluations or we call Google shift, the algorithmic shifting. Um, sometimes it's not a direct penalty, that's the slope thing where you just shift it downward from Google from the algorithm. Again, this can be at the, cool, the keyword page or our demand level. These recoveries are easier because it's just a, you're not going to Google and going, look at my site. By the way, when you do a manual penalty recovery, I forgot to add, make sure everything else on your site is pristine because someone from Google is going through it. If they're going through it and they find something else, you can wind up in more shape. Right? So but with an algorithmic penalty, that doesn't matter. Algorithm and algorithm is an algorithm. You just fix it and the algorithm comes back through and it fixes it for you. Problem is you can wait a really long time between the algorithm changes. So here's Matt Cutts. Matt Cutts puts out tweets, follow him on Twitter. If you're on Twitter, he'll tell you when these penalties are coming out and who they might penalize. It's kind of fun to watch, you know, if it's not you that's getting penalized. It's like, hey, we're going through Germany. That was like last month. Hey, we're rolling through France. Hey, we're taking out these websites. So um, right here is like next generation penalties coming out in the next few weeks. So this is a really good way. And then SEO Moz, or Moz now is what it's called, um, has a really good list of all the major penalties that have come through so you can check it against your website. How many know Penguin and Panda? And Google's annoying way of making them after like fuzzy animals. Like you just took away all my business. Hey, it was a penguin, it was a panda. Okay, these are the two that are most likely going to affect your website. 
This just gives you a real quick look. You can look online for these timelines. I'm just trying to show you that how quickly they kind of roll through over 2011, 2013. Panda no longer comes out as a rollout. It is in the algorithm. Panda, Penguin is your link or over-optimization penalty. Panda is your content quality or thin content penalty. So if your content is not good, uh, it's not high quality, it's too thin, or there's too few words on the page on average on your website, which means under 600, um, Panda will come along and take your site or your site pages out. Panda is now rolled into the algorithm. There's a few tweaks here and there, but basically it just comes along whenever the algorithm is around your website. So you might see a devaluation of your pages, not an actual penalty cliff. Can you get hit by two penalties at once? You can. This is where they tag team, like in a couple of days. Right, you can get hit by a manual and an algorithmic penalty in the same week. We had a client that that happened to. We have one client, big brand, this would only happen to a big brand, who has 18 warnings and penalties. Now, if you were a small site, you'd be gone after two, you wouldn't be in the index anymore, but they're a big brand, and there are lots of reasons behind that. But... So penalties, how do they work? You look like this guy, because you woke up and this is what your site looked like, because you were very bad, you bought spammy links, and see how the curve went after the penalty, after the algorithm rolled through. So Google assumed you're using black hat techniques. Does everyone know what black hat is? No? Okay. So real quick, there's two things that you use outside the industry. It's called white hat techniques and black hat techniques. White hat is basically everything Google says is okay. Link building is what we call gray hat. It's not really Google doesn't say it's okay, but it's not really wrong. Black hat techniques are when you're doing things to like game the algorithm. It's not wrong as long as you're told that the risks and what's going on. It's, it's not like an ethics issue unless I do it to your site and no one told you that you could lose your whole site in the process. My suggestion, never do black hat on your main domain. If you have a cash register site, that is not where you do black hat. You build mini sites and that's where you do black hat. Okay, so black hat techniques allow you to rank like really quickly, like say you have to do the Christmas season and you just roll out your company and you're like, it's September, we don't have time to rank. You might build some mini sites and you might get your business that way and do some black hat techniques in the same time period, right? Buy some links and get those things up there and whatever. But those sites will get burned. If you're doing Black Hat, the chances of getting burned are probably like 80 or 90%. Never do it on your main domain. No matter who tells you that they can do it and do it really well. If someone says, I can rank you in three months at number one, their chances are they're gonna do Black Hat and not tell you. Okay, so be careful with Black Hat. So what happened? You received a penalty at Google. What do you do? This is really simplified, just giving you an idea. So if you have a link problem, there's two things you have to do. You have to audit your links, then you have to remove them. You have to actually go to the websites where those links are and say, please, please, would you please take my link off your site? They actually charge you for this in a lot of cases. So it might be better for you to ask somebody who does link removal as an SEO to get these sites removed. They often have relationships, things like that. Um, but you wanna get up to 60% link removal of your bad links. Not all your links, but of your bad links. Uh, Google usually, um, sometimes you'll see stories where you didn't have to do that, but that's when you usually just had a few links that were bad. But if you really got slapped for bad links, look at 60% link removal before you get to what is called a disavow. The disavow list is where you go through and you say, I say all these links are bad. This is my list of links that I don't like, that I don't want pointing at my site. Do know, once you disavow a link, that domain, that link is burned. If you disavow the whole domain, that domain is burned for you. You can never use that link again. Google's gonna put it on a blacklist. Now, it's not gonna necessarily put it on a blacklist just because you did it. It's gonna compare it against others, but it's on your disavow list, which means you can never use it again. So don't just let someone cut through and give you a dis do a disavow list if you haven't reviewed it, right? Because you may think, no, a site's good, and someone else may think it's bad and not now. Okay, so disavow list is you telling Google I'm disavowing these links. I want nothing to do with them. They're bad links. Someone pointed them to my site. I had no idea. I did not link by. Really, I didn't. Right? And sometimes you didn't. Sometimes someone pointed bad links. Sometimes there's just bad links. Every site has bad links. If your site has no bad links, that looks suspicious too because every site does. But you do want to make sure that when you're disavow, you do it correctly. Um, by the way, you can submit a disavow even if you don't have a manual penalty. So you're supposed to only do this if you have a manual. But you get submitted ahead of time. You just notice bad links to your site. You did an audit. You're like, oh, I don't like these links. They scare me a little bit. I don't want to get a penalty. Go ahead and submit. Because the truth is what this really is about is Google could only find so many spammers. 
and link sellers, and they needed a way to find them. So they created this list so everyone would report them, right? And then you'll see like about once every three months, Google takes out another massive link network. How did they find them? Found them through this, okay? What's that? Yeah, that's exactly what they, that's exactly what they did, right? But it helps you in the meantime if you have a problem. Uh, when you have an algorithmic penalty, you wait for the next Penguin update, notice how it goes back up because they fixed everything and whoop, it goes back up. But they also had to wait from April until October for the penalty algorithm to go back through. Algorithmic penalties will not improve until the algorithm returns to your site and is re-released. Penguin is a re-release. Panda comes around all the time now, so Panda you can get back pretty quickly. Uh, reconsideration summaries. This is on manual penalties only. This just shows you that you go to Google and you beg. Three things about reconsideration summaries, if you have this issue, is that um, you want to make sure they're detailed. You want to make sure that you uh, tell them how you're not going to let it happen again. And you want to tell them how sorry you are that you hurt the mighty Google. I'm actually not kidding. It really seems to work. Like, I'm really, really sorry. We didn't mean to be bad. So some more missing facts. So content-only approach. How many have heard, if you build content, they will come? Right? All you have to do is build content. Everyone will come to your site. You don't need links. Right? Everyone's heard that? Okay, that's both my feces. Okay? Because they're not just going to come because you build great content. So anyone tried that approach? The site with 18 warnings and penalties, by the way, tried that approach. Okay, so one, if all you're doing is building great content and not paying attention to other things, you can overlook things like penalty issues. Second, if all you're doing is building great content, so is everybody else that's in your market if you're competitive. So you're not going to just rank because you're building great content. So just real quick though, when we talk about content, so you still need your links, you got your content, five qualities of great content. I'm not just going to go over every detail here, but a couple key points. Make sure it's over 600 words on most pages. Okay, so you get a few, you know, quick blurbs here and there. But your site, if you're doing content, make sure that your content's over 600 words. If you're a site and you're like, we have no reason to have content, find a reason to have content. Every site can find an interesting reason to have content. We just did a loan site. We did lots of information on loans, right? We have a site that's all social sharing. So we're going to do a section on how to make good social sharing, how to make good pictures, how to make good... Find a way to do content. You need content. Google wants information to share. Uh, if you're marketing and all you're doing is you have ads on your site, then go PPC. Okay? You're not going to compete in this in, nowadays in, at Google if all you're going to do is show, like, here's my big form for people to buy from because Google doesn't care. Right? They don't care what you have to sell. They want to know what you have to offer the user. Content research is about keywords, how people find your content, including variations. So how many people were upset when they lost their keywords in Google Organic? Nobody? Or nobody noticed? I was bothered. <laughs> it's like, I can't tell what that page is like getting visited for anymore. So make sure you research your keyword as well. That you know why people are looking for your content. One letter can make a huge difference. In Vegas, Las Vegas Hotel was what one of the big hotels was trying to rank for. The agency was doing it for them. And I was like, well, you do know you're missing like 13 million potential visitors a month. I'm like, what are you talking about? And I'm like, because uh, Las Vegas Hotels is the keyword. And they're like, what? And so I showed them on the on the actual, you know, how people search in Google, and at the time, the things you could do to look that up. And of course, the Las Vegas Hotel only had 800,000 searches a month, and Las Vegas Hotels had 13 million searches a month. So they were missing almost 13 million searches a month by being one um, letter off. Make sure you include these words in your content. I advise doing it after you've written the content. Like keep them in your mind while you're writing or while your team's writing, but don't optimize around a keyword. Put the keyword in later. Content engagement. Make sure that there's users are interested in your content. You're not just putting content out of the heck of it. And please don't use those headlines of like, this is the most insane thing you've ever seen. Oh my God. Right? Because that was good for about two months. It's over. Right? It's kind of done. So you guys know what I'm talking about, like BuzzFeed and all that, right? Okay. Um, so make sure people are sharing your content, that people are staying on your page long enough to look at your content and read it. Content freshness. This is a myth. Your site does not have to have constantly new content. 
Okay, so a lot of people think your content, your content always has to be new. That's only if you're a new site or a site that's expected to have new content. Now there is something called query deserves freshness. And that means that there's something like happening, like hurricanes or earthquakes or something in the news where there's a reason that query has to be refreshed, then that content you might want to update regularly. That's something that your site focuses on. But in, otherwise, just a blog is sufficient. You don't have to be constantly changing your homepage. Okay, and the next thing is just technical. I probably bored everyone to sleep already. They're already like this, oh my gosh. Um, so, technical, how many people look at technical on SEO? Anyone know there's a relationship? I see two people in the back. Technical is one of the most important things on your website in SEO, right? Because it's how your site delivers, it's, it delivers your site, how fast it delivers your site. Did you know in mobile, if your site delivers slowly, you will rank lower in mobile? How many people? So look, there's a PageSpeed Insights tool you can look up in Google. Just do Google PageSpeed Insights. It'll actually put your URL in there. It'll give you a score on how you're doing on desktop and how you're doing on mobile. If you're not above a 90, you're suffering some devaluation. If you're below a 70, you're in trouble. What's that sign? Uh, it's just PageSpeed Insights. I'm sorry, I did forget to put the URL in here today. So PageSpeed Insights is a Google tool. You can also see it in your analytics. Google will give you a score for every page on your site. So above a 90 is awesome, and you're probably going to do really well. We've seen sites improve in their rankings just from getting their, their page speeds up from like a 70 to a 90. Dramatically, I mean, not just a little bit. So these are all the things. Uh, domains, subdomains, redirects are like your three. Oh, well, I'm sorry, I have these like. So hosting, how many people use shared hosting? Anybody on their sites? These are probably big enough sites you're not using that. On your personal sites, don't use shared. Always buy virtual private. Dedicated, virtual dedicated domains. Okay, when you're shared, it's like whoever your neighbor are it is affects your site a little bit. Anybody using content delivery networks? If you have large sites, you should be using CDNs. Um, Google sees that as a positive, and that means like different places that your content served up from. It makes it faster than if it's just one server that everything's being pulled from. This is for large networks. You don't need it on a, on a small website. Are you using compression on your site? You have heavy graphics on your site. Does your site weigh a lot? Are you compressing your site? If you're not serving your site quickly, you're losing in this race. As things get more mobile, as the things as the mobile industry gets larger and larger, Google's gonna put more of an emphasis on this speed. So caching, compression, these are two things that people always miss in site audits. Uh, how many people are using subdomains? Okay, you know your subdomain carries your um, anything that comes to it in links carries through to the main domain, including penalties. Okay, but you have to actually build your subdomain as a separate website. So usually subdomains, unless there's a really good business reason for it, you want to go to the domain path, not subdomain. Uh, common error in domain on sites is uh, www and the non-ww don't redirect one to the other. Um, also, people forget about their index or default page. You guys know what I'm talking about? Check your own sites right now. See, like, do I put www.mysite, does it, and then non-www, does it redirect one or the other? It should. And then put, like, default or index, it should all redirect to the same page. If it's not doing this, I'm sorry, it's not doing this, then you're giving Google two home pages or three home pages, and that's a problem. It's duplicate content, and you can get yourself filtered out. Uh, proper redirect for almost anything. When you take a page and remove it from your site, when you have a page that's, like, gone from your site, or you're taking something and moving to another, or you're changing your URLs on your site is a 301 permanent redirect. Google actually takes the 302 redirect, which is a temporary one, um, and changes it to a permanent one after three or four months. So there's really very little reason for the 302, which is a temporary redirect unless you just have really, truly temporary thing. Um, coding techniques are really important. Make sure you hire good coders or you're using good code. If you're using like, you know, kits or WordPress or whatever that you're picking out good templates or you're using good coders, you want to make sure that you don't have like inline CSS everywhere and inline JavaScripts and that you're weighing down because you have this thing called a text to code ratio. So I have like all my text and then I have like all this code that the spider has to get through and it causes some devaluations. If you're in a competitive market, these little devaluations can be the placement between one and five or one and ten. 
And the, the traffic difference between like one and five is like 50%. So it's gonna be very major. Crawlability, make sure that your site's crawlable and make sure that your 404 page, like when you type in a page that doesn't exist on your website, you all can do it right now. What do you get for a 404 page? Does it have a, like just a generic one or does it give people a place to go on your site? Does it give them information and tell them, hey, here's how you get back, here's a nice little message. Right, because it's gonna happen. People are gonna break links to your site. They're gonna find the link somewhere on the net and they're gonna come to your site and it's just not gonna be there. Make sure your 404 page gives people a place to go and is custom, not just a standard one that comes up. Page page view we talked about. And mobile inflammation, anyone still using an MDOT? No MDOTs for mobile? No one admitted to it? When you do mobile, how many people have mobile sites for their website, okay, for their company? How many people don't have mobile at all? Okay, get mobile. <laughs> okay, don't do MDOT. Um, there's two ways to do mobile. It's called responsive design and adaptive design. There's actually a third mix called responsive adaptive. I like responsive adaptive the best. That's for coders to figure out, though, in your departments. Someone mentions MDOT, run the other way. MDOT was the way they used to do it. They created a separate site and it was called a subdomain called an MDOT your name, right? But MDOT actually doesn't show up in the main index of Google. It's, it, you'll get a link for it, but that's it. MDOT's actually for feature phones. Now, if you're international and you're working in like Af African market where most of the mobile growth is on feature phones, that's a different story. There's an exception to everything I tell you today. I forgot to say that. Always an exception. But generally speaking, US, Europe, Anywhere where you know, mobile phones are generally smartphones and they're using the regular Google index, you want to make sure that you have, uh, your website is available on mobile and you really want to make sure you're heading towards a responsive or responsive adaptive model. You don't have to worry if you don't, don't know what responsive or adaptive means, just other words. Um, so basically what we just talked about, SEO, basically this is uh, what we've talked about up top. This is everything else. I'm going to talk real quick about myth four. SEO can be cheap. Can't be. Anyone charge of hiring here? Or hiring agencies or hiring people? Good SEO is not cheap. I spend every day, so does my partner, reading e-signs, watching videos, attending, we go to conferences. It changes every day. There were 17 major algorithmic updates last year including Hummingbird, which is a complete overhaul of how Google did the entire algorithm. It went from something called strings to things. So it no longer looked at words, it looked at objects. This is a debate on if this is better, I say no. So if you put in an object it didn't understand, it didn't bring up anything. Has anyone done that where you put in words and Google just like comes back with a kitchen sink of, you're like, what is this? Anybody? Yeah, so something more complex. So you can put in like an NFL football score and it's like, Oh, I've got that, and I've got a picture over here, and I've got this. But you can put in, like, it was during uh, the debt crisis, I think I was looking at it the first time, and I was like, it has not no clue. It has no idea what I'm talking about. It's gotten a little better, but it's not great. So um, the Hummingbird algorithm changed everything. Um, on an average, there are 50 smaller updates per month, 50 to 80 per month on the Google algorithm. Google added last year an advertising penalty, a display penalty, and added page speed into the mobile algorithm, moved pan into the main, added the hummingbird, penalized guest blogging and article directories, and the list goes on from there. So if anyone tells you, comes in and says, I can do your SEO services for cheap, they're not gonna do good SEO for you or they're lying. And when you're hiring people, if you're hiring people for as cheap as you can get them, that's the SEO you're gonna get. Because keeping up with this stuff is a 24 hour day job. I'm not saying that because I want you to go, ooh, but just saying so you know. Could you explain what guest blogging, why would that be? Yeah, a lot of people are asking that too. <laughs> because because if there's anything that's done in the in one way, the people that like to make money find a way to create a kind of spammy way to do it, right? So the guest blogging got out of control, according to Google. Again, this is all according to Google, not personally my opinion. Um, so Google decided no more in general guest blogging. If you do guest blogging on like a really good relevant site, that's fine, okay. right? It's just that you can't do it on a site that's like, if you're doing health IT and it's a health IT site, that's fine. But if it's a site that's doing health IT and like cookie baking, then that's not okay. 
So those are the sites I'll use them. Yeah. Yeah, make sure that any ads they have on their site, they use no follow links on their guest blogs. Okay. So make sure you don't look like you're shilling for the company. Although Matt Cuts put out a bizarre post last week, we still haven't got an answer on, where it's got like 50 links to Google products. Everyone called him out on. So we're still trying to know, was he joking? Was he just doing an example? Or so? Was... Yeah, yeah. Well, Matt's like that though. He does have those, like, he likes to be funny. He actually has a really good personality. We all love Matt. I hate them sometimes. You know, it depends on where your site's at. <laughs> so that's a good question. So how are we doing on time? Oh my gosh, we're over. So I have a bonus section in here for you for authorship um, that you get with the slides. And this is just one of the things Google wanted to get rid of, and we'll have to do questions. I just want to tell you real quick so you can read through this. Google wants to get rid of spam content and provide more relevant information. So they're moving into authenticating authors online. There's a tag called rel author. Has anyone heard of it? Yeah, okay. So rel author is not about just I write online and Google wants to see that. Rel author is about knowing who authors are and that authors are who they say they are. It's an identity tag. Um, Google is in the identity market. And so there's a section here I put in for you just about looking up identity stuff so you know that it's here. If I, if I ran out of time, you could read this. Um, it verifies author and credibility. It also gives you topic experts. These are my up, um, my author stats. There's an update that got rid of a lot of the spam and author stats in December. Um, my impressions are a million one hundred thousand over three months. So this was a little while ago. They're actually one million three hundred thousand now or something, and ninety-seven thousand click over that three months for the one article one ezine I work for or write for. Or write for. So authorship is a really positive thing to look at, and it's a really good strategy to get started in. If it's the only thing that you look at, then I would definitely look into doing this. And that's me, and I'm going to show you one other thing real quick while we get to questions. Oops. And just so you can see, um, this is me for author for meta tags, the word meta tags. For pure spam, that's my business partner and myself. I oh, just, I'm sorry, right here. If you see uh, that picture, that's the author. This is us, right here, pure spam. Uh, SEO audits, if I can get it to click down. This one a little farther down the page. Oh, well, I'm down there, you can't see it, I can't get to move for some reason. Uh, Google penalties, see me down here. Um, site audits right here. You can see it right there. And then one thing we have Jennifer's, which is an author tag. Jennifer, <laughs> your tag was devalued a little bit. <laughs> your picture went away. Where? Uh, you're showing. Yeah, I'll be in where you're showing. Yeah. There's two reasons for that. Either. No, there's two reasons for that. Um, your picture could go away because they don't think it's a good enough picture for facial recognition. So go back and just make sure it's a really good head-on shot. Or the other possibility is just relevancy for the query and strength of your authorship tag. So you just need to write more. I agree with her. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Okay, um, questions, anybody? And hopefully I didn't like bore people to sleep with all the details, but there's so much about SEO, it's hard to know what's good for people. So I, these two I saw at the same time, and then so who was first? I'm not sure. Go ahead. Um, one of the, I guess we may be a simple and silly question, but one of the things maybe everyday people want to know is how do you uh, label your photos if you're going to upload them to your site? Is that even a thing? Does it matter? Does it help the ranking? Yeah, there's, uh, she's asking about labeling photos up to your site. So there's two things you want to do. One, you want to make, well, three. One, you want to label your, your photos with an actual like word and keyword related, but don't keyword stuff. Like if it's um, beach, you know, put ocean or something. Um, use the alt tag on the image always. Um, alt tag is actually used by Google as an actual um, text if it's in a link, and it always looks at those as related. In fact, we had a site that was penalized for stuffing those with keywords. And then third, um, if you have enough photos, make sure that you use a, a sitemap that's for images only. And you can look at that online. Google has a format for that. Uh, I was just curious, what do, what do you think we should do if we have like a CSS JavaScript that has to be above the fold? Uh, what is that going to be? 
Um, then just make sure you put them all in one file um, or combine them as much as possible. So a lot of times we'll have like, or not even templates, just devs, wind up with like 20 files, 20 references. Just narrow them down as much as possible, minify and, and uh, compress. Um, you're not really getting penalized as much. Google always puts that in the page speed insights. You're not getting big penalties for that. So um, usually um, with, the, with the slowness is for things like caching and compression. Um, images especially. So. How do you know? I, I have no idea what you said. <laughs> <laughs> That's always what a sneaker wants to hear. And that impresses me like you, you don't even know. But I have an SEO company. How do I know they're doing all the stuff you said and they're doing it right? You hire us to audit them? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Maybe, a little bit. Um, no, but um, you Generally, one, you would find an outside company to just audit what's going on and just give a report. Um, the other way is um, you can do some reading and educating yourself just to make sure you're seeing the right things. Third is results. So, like, uh, the best way, like, we get clients where we get, always get one person there who thinks they know more. And the thing we usually tell them is, like, who doesn't? And, and who's fighting us on this or that? And we're like, did we get you the results? Are you getting the traffic? Or are you getting their positioning? Or did you recover from the penalty? If the answer is yes, then you know chances are you're okay. Now the other side of that though is, are the techniques ones that could get you in trouble? The only way you're gonna know that is if you get another agency to, to, um, to audit that. Now the best way to do that, to find a good one, or a reputable one, is look for ones that um, look on lanyard and look for people that speak at the SEO conferences. We all know each other. Um, and uh, so the, you're not going to, if someone's speaking at those conferences, PubCon, um, SMX, um, SES, those are the three main ones. There's offshoots, but those are the three main ones. Uh, those people are going to be reputable, at least at some level. Uh, just a quick follow-up to that. I have also a pay-per-click, you know, paid campaign, and I'm always uh, trying to find out what the best juxtaposition of the two trying to leverage paid to push search and you know having them play nice together do you have any kind of insights into how that works there's really um so there's there's two things one is a complete myth that paid affects search on the back end so you you could put 10 million into a paid account it's not going to affect your search results right you get a google rep that's helpful because if you have a problem then google will talk to you but other than that, you don't get like you don't get a bump. The, the units are separate, and they don't. There's reasons for that, right? So they don't make money off each other. Um, but on the other side, on authority to a user, if you're a number like in the column over here, um, three four position and one two not as much. People skip it visually, but three four and people see your name here, they assume you're an authority. So if there's a term that you want people to know, like you know, there's a product that you're selling or you're competing with, whatever it is. You want people to assume that you're the guy for it, then you want to go ahead and make sure that you buy terms on that, on the key, you know, peak hours when people would be searching, so that they think that you're the branded authority. That's generally where those two cross over. Is that? Okay. I think last question, uh, I think we're at the end. Okay, I use a tool on GoDaddy that gives like 10 step verification if your SEO company is doing proper work. Um, again, it would just be more on results. And not really, tools really aren't generally very good at measuring SEO. So the reason is, is because there's a whole strategy behind what you do. Um, so like the, the company we had in recovery from their penalty, there was very weak SEO on the site at the time. And the reason was, we wanted to make sure that Google knew they were playing completely natural and fair while they were in penalty status, um, while Google was still watching them. Um, there's other times where you may amp something up. Um, the, the tools also aren't very good at, at really gauging much more um, than what it, they give you data, but if you don't know how to interpret that data, um, you may assume something to be important that it's not. No, 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 just like that one, that one company. You can be out of a penalty in days. Um, penalties can be as little as they just got rid of links coming to your site um, to as massive as they get rid of your site. 
Um, generally, if you get a really bad penalty, it's, I mean, like the most severe, other than complete de-indexation, is you type in your name for your company and your homepage doesn't come up. This suit, by the way, if that happens to you, and it can happen, as soon as that happens, call the SEO, like find an SEO reputable company immediately. We get people that come to us like 15 months, 16 months, 20 months later. Well, that penalty is so set at that point, it takes six, eight, 10 months to get that site back. Because the longer a penalty sits, the longer Google will, t it will take in Google to get it back. So the minute you have it, also if you make a mistake, let's say you put a no follow on your site, or no index, I'm sorry, de-index. You no index your site, you de-index it, right? By accident, it's happened. I'm sure people have heard of that, right? So you do something major on your site, you make a major mistake. Google has this weird little window, and I cannot, you will never find anybody writing about it, of like 24 to like 48 hours, where I think it's just called the, oops, I'm an idiot, right? And it will come back to your site a couple of times to see if it's still there. So if you've made a major mistake, if it's Friday night and it's two in the morning, you're at the best party of your entire life, sorry, get in your office and fix it. Okay, because if you fix it in that 24, 48 hours, almost always the site will come immediately back. You don't have no long-term or permanent damage. Don't wait two days, don't wait till Monday, don't wait till, because it always happens on the weekend, apparently, at least in my experience. So anyway, so hopefully that was helpful for everybody. I know some of it was like a little deeper, probably. But. Let's give Christine a <laughs>